webinar will cover an in-depth analysis of the most common failure modes of bellows with remedies to extend the life of your bellows. Some of the fixes you'll be able to implement immediately and others you can upgrade upon replacement. I'm Katie Lohman and joining me is Eric Davis, our Director of Customer Relations. So Eric, this squirmed expansion joint was operating when the photo was taken. What advice do you have for the end user? Well Katie, first I would clear the area. Then I would shut down the line of the unit and replace the expansion joint. This bellows, which is squirmed, could rupture at any time. My. What about improvements or upgrades? We want to first identify the root cause of the failure, typically overpressurization or excessive movement. Mm -hmm. We'll cover this in more detail during the webinar. What else will we cover during the webinar? We'll cover the most common failure modes. Attachment weld failure, corrosion, mm -hmm. improper installation, physical damage, overpressurization, and fatigue. We'll explain the telltale signs of each failure mode and what can be done to improve the performance. Sounds great. So let's get started with attachment weld failure. Poor Bellows neck fit up has caused the attachment weld to hinge at the unsupported root, producing fatigue failure within the weld. This bellows should have been sized to fit the attachment pipe spool. The best way to guarantee this is to require that the outside diameter of the pipe spool be measured with the pie tape after forming and the bellows should be manufactured for a tight fit up or specify the allowable tolerances. Understood. One of our engineers can provide tolerances depending upon diameter, application, materials, and etc. What are the telltale signs of improper fit up? Behind us you can see where the bellows has been forced or hammered down to the pipe spool. Mm -hmm. This workmanship should be rejected and the rework be a better fit up quality. Right, that's great advice. Let's move on to corrosion, which probably is the most common failure mode. What exactly are the most common corrosion attacks? Uniform attack, mm -hmm. local such as pitting, environmental such as chloride SCC, and intergranular. General corrosive attack can result in deep surface pitting, widespread evidence of chemical attack, and generalized material loss. Concentrated areas of corrosion may be evident at the edge of standing condensate pools within the bottom of the bellows convolutions. Okay. What are the primary causes of pitting failure and what can be done to increase the bellows life? Incorrect material selection, stagnant fluid, surface defects such as scratches. To increase the bellows performance, the user should consider selecting more resistant materials, avoid internal de surface defects, avoid stagnant system conditions where possible. All right. How about crevice corrosion? Sounds like a different variation of pitting attack? That's correct. Crevice corrosion is the same as pitting except where it occurs. Crevice corrosion occurs in crack and crevices between mating surfaces. Okay. The mating surfaces prevent ready access to oxygen that may be present in the media. Under bellows attachments is a typical location. Okay. What about chloride SCC or stress crack corrosion? What would a user expect to find? Widespread branching cracks, typically at the convolution crest and usually across the grains. What are the conditions that cause chloride SCC? Chlorides or other halides such as fluorine, bromine, or iodine, temperature greater than 140 degrees, residual or applied tensile stress, and an electrolyte such as water or steam. What are the solutions to chloride SCC? Material selection, higher nickel materials, stress relieve or anneal the bellows, or lower the operating stress level, restrict the use of chlorides, and avoid 300 series stainless steels if the chlorides can't be avoided. Thank you. Chloride SCC is the leading cause of corrosion failure in bellows. What about caustic SCC? Caustic SCC occurs when the bellows is exposed to caustic substances while subjected to tensile stress. Caustic substances can include sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and calcium oxide. What other conditions required for caustic SCC to occur? Well, besides the caustic, a tensile stress, steam or water, and a temperature above 550 degrees are required. This type of corrosion is common in superheated steam systems. Okay. To prevent caustic SCC, it is best to avoid 300 series stainless steels and nickel alloys. Nickel 201 or 200 as an interply is a good solution. Thank you. Let's move on to polythionic acid SCC. Polythionic acid can occur in hydrocarbon services during shutdowns, correct? That's correct. Polythionics SCC can cause cracking when it's present in materials with a tensile stress, such as residual stress in the bellows. The stainless steel can develop an iron sulfide film, for example, from exposure to hydrogen sulfide in service. 
when condensation is present, such as during a shutdown, mm -hmm. the acid and thus the cracking can occur. Corrosion accounts for many failures, but there can be other causes of failure. What about installation? What type of failures can occur there? Anchors and or guides missing or incorrectly placed, excessive movements, shipping bars not removed, and an improper insulation. Improper installation is likely the second most frequent cause of expansion joint failure. Incorrect guiding and anchoring of the piping system can expose the expansion joint to excessive movements. Mm -hmm. Correcting unspecified piping misalignments with an expansion joint can also produce excessive movements since the amount of misalignment could be additive to the intended service movements. These excessive movements can produce bells, distortion, early fatigue failure, or in most severe cases, rupture. What about physical damage? Sometimes the physical damage that can occur are dents and dings, scratches and gouges, and weld spatter. The relatively thin bellows can be easily damaged through improper handling and exposure to sources of physical damage. Dents that produce sharp creases that can dramatically reduce the expected fatigue life of the bellows. Deep scratches and gouges in the bellows can produce stress risers, leading to premature bellows fatigue failure. Weld spatter and arc strikes can burn through the bellows. Okay. Unexpected operating conditions is another failure mode, correct? Yes. Conditions not designed for can result in bellows failure. These most common are excessive pressure, pressure instability, such as column and in plane, root bulge, rupture, and torsion. All right, would you mind discussing each one of these, please? Sure. Pressure instability, or squirm as it's often called, has two forms, column and in plane. Okay. A gross lateral shift at the center of the bellows away from the longitudinal center line is indicative of column squirm. This type of squirm can occur if an internally pressurized bellows is subjected to excessive pressure. The mechanics of the failure are similar to the buckling of a cylindrical column under compressive load. Water hammer can cause this from the shutting of a valve, turning a pump on, or having water in a steam line that flashes and produces a pressure spike. Column squirm may also occur if the bellows length to diameter ratio is increased by excessive axial extension or angular rotation, reducing the column stability of the bellows. Bellows squirm will result in a reduced life of the bellows and a reduced pressure capacity. In-plane squirm is the loss of parallelism and symmetrical spacing between adjacent convolutions. Caused by excessive stresses due to pressure, plastic hinges form at the root and the crest of the convolutions. This distortion alters the uniform distribution of deflection stresses, resulting in a shortened fatigue life. Thank you, Eric. What other failures can excessive pressure cause? Root bulge. Severe pressure can cause the roots of the convolutions to expand or bulge outward. Root bulge may also occur if the bellows is extended beyond its intended range of motion. All right, I'm looking at this one here, and this one looks pretty ugly. Yes, torsion. The twisting of the bellows about its longitudinal axis can produce severe distortion. Note the distortion can appear similar to in-plane squirm. However, diagonal striations or cracking will often be evident on the sidewall of the outboard convolutions. Okay, what are the causes of fatigue cracking? Vibration continuous pressure fluctuations, or stress concentrations. Bellows are designed to absorb a given set of displacements based on the specified thermal movements. Our metal expansion joint design manual is typically based on 2,000 full thermal cycles, which is a practical design target for continuous service applications. Mm -hmm. However, certainly highly cyclic applications may require a much higher fatigue life. Unexpected operating conditions such as mechanical or flow-induced vibration, large continuous pressure fluctuations, torsional rotation, and points of severe stress concentration can greatly shorten the bellows fatigue life. What are the other sources of vibration? Flow-induced and mechanical, such as rotating equipment. Deflections that are high frequency and low amplitude vibration can strain hard the material, ultimately resulting in a fatigue crack. The source of vibration can be from a high flow velocity in direct contact with the bellows convolutions. This can occur if a flow liner is omitted or if the flow liner has failed. The vibration can also be mechanical, such as that from direct connection to a rotating pump. That's interesting. So how can you tell if the failure is from fatigue? Non-branching cracks, straight through the pressure wall, slight material thinning, mm -hmm. circumferential at the crest or root or attachment. Fatigue cracking in a bellows often appears as non-branching transgranular cracks 
but can also follow grain boundaries and fracture directly through the wall of the material. Under magnification, thinning at the crack edge can often be detected. Fatigue failure of a bellows most frequently appears as circumferential cracking at the crest or in the root, and typically within the first few convolutions on either side, or in proximity to the attachment well. Less frequent are fatigue cracks occurring in the more flexible intermediate convolutions. Fatigue due to escaping media can produce localized flutter and fragmentation of the bellows. This can occur within several hours of initial failure. The cylindrical liner is attached at only one end, and the unsupported mass magnifying stresses at the attachment well. High flow velocities and turbulent flow can act to produce excessive stresses at the liner attachment well. Okay, so what are some solutions? Multiply bellows, thinner material, higher strength material, stress relieve the bellows, avoiding resonance, and adding a flow line or a cover. Fatigue light can be enhanced in numerous ways. Laminated bellows consisting of multiple plies are inherently more flexible than a single ply bellows of equal total thickness. High strength alloys such as alloy 625 require less material thickness to retain pressure stresses, thereby reducing fatigue due to deflection stresses. Certain applications can benefit from stress relieving after forming. If the vibration frequency is known, a bellows can be designed to avoid resonant response. All right, so what about flow liners and covers? Flow liners protect the bellows from direct flow velocity contact and reduce the possibility of flow-induced resonant response. Flow velocities exceed 100 feet per second and expansion joints located within 10 pipe diameters downstream of elbows, tees, and valves require increased liner thickness and should be brought to the attention of the manufacturer. External covers can protect the bellows from damage that can produce stress risers and shorten bellows life. The same conditions for external covers apply if there's an external flow condition. Thank you very much, Eric. Would you mind summing up the more common errors made in the design and installation phase? Certainly. Correct alloy selection for the environment, mm -hmm. proper anchors and guides, protection from physical damage, avoiding unspecified misalignment, compensation, and torsion, use of flow liners for high flow velocity or abrasive service, insulating the bellows to stay above the acid dew point, and not insulating very high temperature applications. Thanks, Eric. That was a lot of very detailed information. So if you have a question or a problem with an application, feel free to call us for additional information. Thank you for joining us.